Good day, class. I hope that you are still doing well in your own households. Please continue to wear masks whenever you are outside and maintain social distancing. In the previous discussion that we had in Module 4, we talk about the rise of nationalism. And on that rise of nationalism, we specifically talk about the events of 1872. Now, for this module on the American occupation, I would like you to still be reminded of the events that we had in the previous module because whatever are the things that will transpire and will unfold in this module has something to do with the previous module. So let us further assess what happened in module four. In module four, especially on the rise of nationalism, we talk about the becoming of the Gumborza and especially Rizal. Taking that into consideration, I would like you to understand that the death of Rizal, especially on the early 19th century, had opened so many opportunities and strengthened the campaign for nationalism. With that in mind, again, reminding you that there are three very essential years in the history of the Filipino nation. In the previous module, we talk about the year 1872. And for this module, module 5, which is the American occupation, we will be talking about the events of 1896 and the events of 1898 that are a breakthrough of the events of 1872. So without further ado, class, I welcome you all to our next module. And we will be talking about the American colonial rule in the Philippines, their arrival, resistance, and responses. In 1895, when the Spanish colony in the Philippines had understood that they can no longer stop the different uprisings that are happening in the different fronts of, of Luzon, they realized that they cannot also contain another oppressor. Taking that on note, we have to understand that the 1895 events, especially for Spain, had been so threatening that on those years, there are only three remaining colonies left to the, Sp to the Spaniards. We have Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. However, History has been playing a lot with the Spanish colony when on 1895, a Cuban revolution broke out. And with that Cuban revolution, the United States, United States of America had, had extended its hand to Cuba for one simple reason, and that the liberation of Cuba would give them an advantage, especially on their trading relations with other nations. Eventually, Cuba was able to rise against the Spaniards, and on May 1898, the United States had challenged Spain to a battle. In continuation of our discussion, I would like to situate you that during the 18th century to 19th century, especially on the year 1895, there are only three colonies left to Spain, and that is Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. On this period, the power of Spain had waned over its colonies. In short, during this year, the Cuban Revolution took place. Now, what about the Americans and how come they, they arrive into play in this history of the Filipino people? On 1895, the United States had extended its helping hand to Cuba in their fight against independence, especially towards Spain for the prime reason that the liberation of Cuba would give them an advantage, especially on their trading relation with other nations on that period. Thereafter, on May 1, 1898, the United States had challenged Spain to a battle. Plus, I would like to emphasize that during this period, when we talk about American battle that happened between the U.S. and Spain, there are two kinds of battle fought, and that happened in May 1, 1898, and the other one happened in August. But I'll, I'll be specific with the first battle. On May 1, 1898, uh, Spain and U.S. had their battle in Manila Bay. With this battle, uh, the, the United States was headed by uh, Commodore General Dewey, and the Spaniards was headed by Montojo. 
with several attempts to win over and against the Americans, the Spaniards eventually had lost the battle with the United States. But it did not necessarily mean that the U.S. colony had started on 1898, especially on May 1. There are several events that happened thereafter that welcome, or whether they are really welcome to the Philippines, that, that strengthened the American occupation in the Philippines. Let us proceed to the next discussion. When Aguinaldo returned to the Philippines after a self-exile in Hong Kong, he established a dictatorial government. And you know what, class? The best and the most outstanding achievement of Aguinaldo that happened on 1898 was the proclamation of independence that happened in Kawit Cavite. It was the first time that the Philippine flag was made in Hong that was made in Hong Kong by Marcela Agoncillo, while the Marcha Nacional Filipina, a composition of Juan Felipe, was playing in Kawit Cavite. For us Filipinos, the events of June 12, 1898 was the signal of Philippine independence, and it is our signal of independence against the Spanish forces that took around 300 years to stay in the Philippines. However, when Aguinaldo established the dictatorial government in 1898, the kind of republic he established was not sovereign, but a mere protectorate under the protection of the United States. Aguinaldo did not know because when he exiled in Hong Kong, he was made to believe by the Americans that the Americans has no intention of colonizing the Philippines. However, when the flag was hoisted in Kawit Cavite, later did Aguinaldo knew that the kind of republic that they established through the independence that they waged in Kawit Cavite was not sovereign. It was a mere protectorate under the protection of the United States. Because as we go along with the discussion, you will realize that the policies that the United States wanted to impose in the Philippines was that of a benevolent assimilation and not something that would give the Filipinos its complete independence from the Spaniards. Okay, class, at this point, let's have a checkpoint. To assess further whether or not you really listened to the pre-recorded discussion, I want you to answer a very specific question that is so important in the history of the Filipino people. You just have to complete the date of the Philippine independence. So you may pause this pre-recorded discussion and fill in, the fill in your answer to the question asked earlier. In the earlier discussion that we had, we talked about the two different wars or battles fought between the United States and Spain in, in U.S. attempt to occupy the Philippines. At this point, we will be talking about the second battle. And this happened on August 1898. Now, on this part of history, on August 1898, Spain and, the, Spain and United States agreed to have a staged battle. On this staged battle, they agreed to sign thereafter the Treaty of Paris. So what is the Treaty of Paris all about that was signed on December 10, 1898? Now, the Treaty of Paris was an agreement between the United States and Spain that Spain would turn over the Philippines to the United States in exchange of the staggering $20 million. Now, you might ask, what is this payment for? Why does U.S. has to give this lump sum of money to Spain? In the primary source sources written by a lot of historians and um, scholars in history, they believe that this $20 million was paid by the United States to Spain because it wants to pay the improvements made by Spain for the last 300 years of colony in the Philippines. Second question that you might ask, why is it the battle was staged? Why is it a pretend battle? Because Spain asked for United States cooperation and that they, before they want to go back to Spain, they wanted to preserve whatever arms, whatever they had 
that is left in the Philippines. And to protect and to preserve that, they would just create a staged battle to prove that the Spaniards had already lost its power and that the United States or the Americans are the next colonizer of the Philippines. Basing on the explanation I had earlier, this anti-Filipino treaty proved that U.S. imperialists had never recognized the Republic of the Philippines. Why? Because on the same year, we already discussed earlier that the Filipinos, led by Aguinaldo, already waged the flag in Kawit Cavite. We already signaled our independence, asking the Spaniards to accept and to recognize the proclamation of independence. With the Americans having known the independence wage on June 12, 1898, they still pursued with the Treaty of Paris on December 10. In short, there is a conflicting acceptance that happened between the Filipinos and the Americans. The Americans could just have simply accepted the independence that we waged on June 12, 1898, but they still continue and connive with the Spaniards on creating the Treaty of Paris that happened on December 10. With all of this anti-Filipino treaty, what is the effect to this to the Filipino people on 1898? While we celebrate 1898 as our independence, we cannot deny the fact that this independence was not recognized by the United States of America. At this point, let's have another checkpoint class. So, if earlier I asked you about the complete date of the Philippine independence, I want you now to answer the name of the treaty signed by the United States and Spain, wherein Spain would turn over the Philippines to the United States for a staggering amount of $20 million. So, give me the name of the treaty. So at this juncture of the discussion, we will be talking about the Americans' Benevolent Assimilation Proclamation. As a recap, we understood in the previous, previous discussion that the Treaty of Paris was signed on December 10, 1898. To officially start the American occupation in the Philippines on December 21, 1898, President McKinley made his Benevolent Assimilation Proclamation. He announced that the U.S. would enforce its sovereignty over the Filipinos. Up until today, class, there are a lot of issues whether or not the Benevolent Assimilation Proclamation is beneficial or not to the Filipinos. But looking it at the perspective of the Americans, they believe on the white man's burden. So what is that white man's burden that preempted the Benevolent Assimilation Proclamation? The Americans believe that the white people has the duty of salvation and education to the uncivilized nations. And because they considered the Philippines during that time as a nation that would need civilization, especially on education, they find it fitting to proclaim the benevolent assimilation. However, Aguinaldo opposed because he believed that the U.S. intervention on the sovereignty of the islands. He warned that the Filipino government was prepared to fight should the U.S. troops attempt to colonize the islands in the Visayas. General Otis, however, considered Aguinaldo's proclamations as challenges to war. And so the Americans silently prepared for a war of aggression. And this will be our topic in the succeeding slides. So at this juncture, I want you to answer another question that is related to the topic I discussed earlier. So for the question, what policy outlined the different colonial policies of the Americans to the Philippines? Suffice your answer in the blue box on my right. Okay. With all the discussions that we had earlier, the Americans not being able to accept the sovereignty of the Filipinos and not being able to recognize the independence that we had on June 12, 1898. The question now is, what are the Filipinos' responses to the American colonial rule? 
to level off the history of the American occupation in the Philippines, let us also understand why the United States would expand its colony, especially to the Philippines. During that time, especially in the 18th to 19th century, the Americans were gearing towards industrialization. And so the first three objectives that you are seeing here on your screen are the three economic objectives why the United States would want to colonize the Philippines. Number one, the Americans needed new market for their products. They wanted a country where they can export the surplus and whatever products that they had in their country. Second, they were also on the lookout for new sources of cheap raw materials because for countries like us, especially in the Philippines, which is very rich in natural resources, they can get a lot of raw and cheap materials in our country. Third, the U.S. hoped to use the Philippines as its base in its drive to control the entire Pacific Ocean and other countries. In short, they made use of the Philippines as a diving board towards their plans in Asia, especially in the Pacific Ocean and the nearby countries all over Asia. That is why they wanted to control and put hold on this countries in Asia, especially that the Philippines is the best strategic place to start all of this. However, President McKinley and President Wilson made the Filipino believe that the Americans' intention was to teach the latter about democracy and governance. Going back to the Benevolent Assimilation Proclamation, the white man's burden made us believe that they are here not to give salvation and education to the uncivilized countries. With all of this proclamation, we were made to believe during that time that they are here again for democracy and governance, which is the effect of all the things that they had brought to the Philippines. Now, with talking about democracy and governance in the succeeding slides that we'll be talking later, we will understand how the Americans was able to transition their objectives in the Philippines and their plan towards the governance and democracy in our country. With all the different objectives laid down why the United States wanted to colonize the Philippines, Aguinaldo and the Filipinos, again led by Aguinaldo, was able to decipher that there are a lot different plans that the United States wanted to the Philippines, which are also disadvantages to the Filipino people. And the question that I posed earlier about what were really the responses of the Filipinos to the American occupation in the Philippines? So what is really the responses of the Filipinos to the American colonization in the Philippines? The outbreak of the Filipino-American War did not happen overnight. In short, Aguinaldo was made to believe that he just wanted to create an independent Philippines. However, with the advice of Mabini, Apolinario Mabini advised Aguinaldo that from a dictatorial government, they have to transform it to a revolutionary government. Now, with that revolutionary government, it threatened eventually the Americans. And so the flames of war were ignited because of one very specific incident. Grayson, which is an American soldier, fired at the Filipino soldier. It prompted an exchange of fires between the two groups. So when this exchange of um, fires took place between the Filipinos and the Americans, it was misinterpreted by the Americans as an assault towards their soldiers. And so, General MacArthur ordered to assault the Filipino troops, and it was being responded to by Aguinaldo in this manner. I'll give you the verbatim response of Aguinaldo to this incident. Sabi ni Aguinaldo, he have not ordered the Filipino soldiers to fire and armed fighting must be stopped. In short, it was an admission on the part of Aguinaldo that we do not want to start a war with Americans. In fact, Aguinaldo was able to explain to the Americans that there was no attempt to start the battle with the Americans. However, General Otis replied that fighting had already begun, so we shall see it to the end. 
Now, in an earlier discussion, I've mentioned that the Americans was starting to prepare for a war because they understood that the revolutionary government of the Filipinos was gearing towards something. Now, the incident that happened between Grayson and the Filipino soldier was made use by the Americans as their excuse and their signal to start the Filipino-American War. Okay, to give you an overall background what happened to the Filipino-American War, I'm presenting to you this very short video clip created to us by Xiao Chua. <laughs> It's show time! 116 years ago, February 4, 1899, nagsimula ang digmaang Pilipino-Amerikano. Noong tinawag itong insurrection ng mga Pilipino laban sa mga Amerikano. Ngunit, kung tatanggapin natin ito, sinasabi natin na nasa ilalim na nga tayo noon ng mga Amerikano. Pinalitan ito ng mga historyador na Pilipino ng Philippine-American War. Sapagkat ang Estados Unidos noon ay nakikipaglaban na sa isang republika. Ang republika ng mga Pilipino sa Malolos. Noong mga panahon na yon, nakita na ng mga Pilipino ang interes ng mga Amerikano na sakupin ng Pilipinas sa kabila ng pagtulong nila sa atin upang magapi ang mga Espanyol. Hindi sila pinapasok ng mga Amerikano sa Maynila at pinagsarahan pa ang ating mga diplomat ng Pinto sa Paris sa mga usapan para sa pagbili ng Amerika sa Pilipinas mula sa Espanya. Nilagdaan ng tratado noong December 10, 1898. Subalit, hindi pa agad ito epektibo. Ito ay kailangan munang aprobahan ng Kongreso ng Estados Unidos. Mainit ang mga naging debate. Para kina William Jennings Bryan at mga Democrats, mga anti-imperialist sila. Hindi dapat kunin ang Pilipinas. Ngunit, ang mga Republicans naman, ang mga pro-imperialist, kailangan nila tayong masakop upang ituro sa atin ang demokrasya at pamamahala to Christianize and civilize our little brown brothers. Ito ang tinatawag nilang white man's burden. Obligasyon ng puti na gawin ito sa mga iba ang kulay. Nais nice na tayo sakupin ng may mabuting hangarin. Benevolent assimilation. <laughs> mga sentimental imperialists. Noong gabi ng February 4, 1899, isang Amerikanong may dugong Ingles na si Private William Grayson ay nakakita ng isang Pilipinong naglalakad malapit sa tinatawag na Black House 7. Ayon sa kanya, I yelled, Halt! And made it pretty loud for I was accustomed to challenging the officer of the guard in approved military style. I challenged him with another loud, Halt! Then he shouted, Alto to me! Well, I thought the best thing to do was to shoot him. He dropped. If I didn't kill him, I guess he died of fright. May pagkastupido rin itong Amerikanong ito. Paano titigil ang Pinoy kung sa Ingles niya sinabi ang kanyang warning? Si Corporal Anastasia Felix ng 4th Company, Batalyong Morong, ang unang tinamaan ng bala. Nagkabarila na ang mga puwersang Pilipino na nagmula sa direksyong San Juan del Monte at ang mga Amerikano. Nga pala, hindi ito nangyari sa tulay ng San Juan tulad ng matagal na nating alam, kundi sa may bandang Santa Mesa na kung saan matatagpuan ang Black House 7. Sa kalya Silencio, pagitan ng Sotiego sa Santa Mesa, Maynila. Kinabukasan, sa tulay na nga ng San Juan at iba pang mga lugar sa Maynila at mga kalapit na lugar, tumindi ang bakbakan. Ang daming namatay. At dahil pinakalat ng mga Amerikano na tayong mga Pilipino ang unang nagpaputok ng baril, ayun, lumakas ang suporta para sa pagsakop ng Pilipinas. At noong February 6, 1899, naratipika ang Tratado ng Paris sa Kongreso ng Estados Unidos at naging legal sa mga Amerikano ang pananakop nila ng Pilipinas. Ito ang medyo nakakabwisit na pagsisimula ng ating pakikidigma sa mga Amerikano. Isang digmaan na kumitil ng tinatayang dalawang daang libong mga Pilipino. Matatapos ang digmaan hindi pa sa pagkahuli kay General Aguinaldo noong 1901, kundi sa huling laban ng mga Moro at Amerikano sa Budbagsak noong 1913. Ako po si Chua, Paas Telebisyon ng Bayo. And that, So class, remember, if you have any question, you may just post it in the inquiry and concern section in our online classroom homepage or reserve it during our synchronous class.